Hi there. Welcome to a video overview of the Bodo Python Analytics Engine. My name is Nick Rizanovsky, and I am a software engineer here at Bodo AI. In this video, we will explore how Bodo provides extreme performance and scalability for Python data science workloads with little to no programmer effort. In subsequent videos, we will offer in-depth details on using Bodo in practice. But first, let's discuss what makes Bodo so revolutionary. The main challenge Bodo addresses is the fact that developing and deploying data analytics and machine learning applications is very difficult in practice. The reason is that analytics has conflicting agility and performance requirements. Data scientists need the simplicity and agility of Python to enable an iterative development workflow, but high-level languages such as Python are slow and sequential. This has led to the emergence of other teams to assist with performance and scaling. These teams rewrite the original code to use a scaling architecture, like Spark, which involves development of a lot of glue code. However, this rewrite makes the development process complicated and inefficient, and the resulting code becomes impractical to maintain by data scientists. Even if successful, existing scaling architectures may leave orders of magnitude performance on the table. This means the final code may not meet the speed and cost requirements of the application. Bodo solves this problem by providing extreme performance for Python code without any rewrites at all. Now let's talk a little bit about the background of scalability and performance for data analytics and related areas. Since the early 80s, the high performance computing or HPC community has been developing applications very differently than mainstream enterprises. In the HPC community, typically HPC experts or PhDs specializing in HPC write very low level code with MPI, Fortran, and C++. The resulting programs are very fast and scalable can run on huge numbers of cores. For context, the largest supercomputers have millions of cores. But the issue is that these programs are pretty complicated and take several years or even decades to develop. So this approach is not practical for a lot of applications. On the other hand, the mainstream analytics programmers have been writing high-level scripting code in tools like MATLAB and now mostly Python, which are very simple and can do a lot with a few lines of code. The problem with these programs is that they are slow and single core, so they don't scale well at all. This difference has been a large gap for 40 years, and in computer science, it's typically called the productivity performance gap. Since the big data trends started in the early 2000s, some groups started building systems somewhere between HPC and mainstream computing. They provide some high-level APIs that are not as easy as regular APIs, but not as difficult as HPC. They also deliver performance and scalability that's somewhere in between. Their architecture underneath is not HPC, but tries to mimic parallelism using master executor designs which are way slower than HPC. Some of the frameworks that started that way include Hadoop, and then Spark, and now some Python frameworks are following the same path. Bodo combines the simplicity and agility of Python with the extreme performance and scalability of HPC. So with Bodo, it's not a compromise between productivity and performance at all. Bodo can achieve this through automatic parallelization, optimization, and distribution of the Python code without any code rewrites. The Bodo engine can be used for a wide range of analytics use cases, such as ETL, data preparation, feature extraction, and many other tasks. This universality results from comprehensive support for fundamental Python analytics primitives, especially pandas and numpy APIs. In addition, the engine is installed as a regular Python package, which can be integrated with any Python code. Python users can use it directly for a pure Pythonic experience on any cluster or cloud environment. What does Bodo do that made this universality and extreme performance possible? We call Bodo an inferential compiler. It doesn't just translate code to binary, it understands what it's doing and infers the parallelism from the application code. In Bodo, all the programmer has to do is annotate their Python functions that use pandas and numpy APIs to tell Bodo to optimize them. They run the code in the same way as they'd run their Python code. So from the programmer perspective, the workflow doesn't change at all. In the background, Bodo automatically replaces these functions with an optimized binary that's fully parallelized as well. This is as if an HPC expert rewrites the code for you, but this happens in real time. All the necessary tools and libraries, such as MPI, are also integrated automatically. The code on the right is actually generated from the code on the left and has the assembly vector instructions, which is pretty exciting. As I mentioned earlier, in terms of architecture, the other systems use a master executor architecture. Let's look at their workflow process using Spark as a concrete example. The programmer has to rewrite the Python code in Spark's APIs. This code runs on a single process, and when the Spark runtime system is called, 
With these high-level APIs, it will divide their work into tasks and send them to the cores across the cluster. Then when they compute their results, they send it back to their master. So we can see that the master is a bottleneck, and we describe this flow as having waves of tiny tasks. With Boto, however, Python code is compiled to a native parallel binary that doesn't need a heavy runtime system, and the code runs on all the processes as opposed to a single process. Each process owns a chunk of data and knows what to communicate and when to communicate. There is no master in the middle, and this is called the single program multiple data paradigm. This is the default architecture for all supercomputing applications. I should mention that while we are comparing ourselves to Spark in terms of performance and scalability, it makes sense for Boto to be embedded inside of Spark if someone has already invested in Spark infrastructure. This is possible because Spark has an MPI connector now, so you could mix and match Spark phases with Python Boto phases in the middle. Since Python UDFs inside Spark are a performance bottleneck, using Boto can produce a notable improvement on your workloads. Now I want to show you an example of some Python code with Boto. Pi estimation using the Monte Carlo method is often used to demonstrate programming models of analytics engines. The Boto version adds a simple JIT annotation only to the NumPy code for it. The execution workflow remains the same as in Python. The only difference is that Boto compiles this function and replaces it with a parallelized and optimized version automatically. Imagine an HPC expert rewrote the program in MPI and C++ to make this code run efficiently on any number of processors. Boto does this automatically and in real time with just this one annotation. During straightforward benchmarking of this example, we used an input size of 70 billion on a four node AWS cluster, and we found that Boto was 116 times faster than Spark. Since the computation is fine grained in this case, a task scheduling master executor system like Spark spends most of the time in overheads instead of useful computation. Here's another example using Boto, but this time it deals with processing tabular data. Data scientists often write tabular data processing code in pandas, but big data systems usually require SQL or data frame like code. Boto supports Pandas code and outperforms SQL systems significantly. Even though Spark is highly optimized for these use cases, compute time for Boto was 63 times faster than Spark for this example on a four node AWS cluster using a 100 gigabyte data set. That concludes our introduction to Boto. If you're interested in learning more, you can check out our website, which is the same as our name, boto.ai. On that website, you will find our documentation and the first of a series of blog posts exploring Boto in more detail. We will have more videos soon explaining how to get started, so please consider subscribing to our channel to get the latest updates. Lastly, if you have any questions about Boto, feel free to drop a comment on this video. See you soon!